hi good evening aspirants today i'm going to start a new channel in youtube and this channel the name of the channel is inception era and this channel is for all the aspirants and this is an educational channel and i think today is going to be a good day to start this channel as today it's teachers day and first of all happy teachers day to all the teachers in the world i'm not extending my speech today i'll be dealing with spectrums a brief history of modern india and today we will Uh, look upon the chapter 1 of this book and that will be the revolt of 1857 and what is revolt of 1857 so revolt of 1857 is otherwise known as sepoy mutiny and some people say that it is the first war of independence and some say it is not so there are many things in and around this revolt we will be dealing with everything and first of all let's see there are there, there are we will be discussing about the causes of the revolt there are many causes such as socio cultural economic and political so first of all we'll be dealing with economic causes okay so what will be the economic causes as usual the britishers used to impose heavy taxation upon the poor peasants and the farmers and as usual they were not able to pay the tax and at such situations the peasants resorted to loans from money lenders traders at assurous rates the latter often evicting the former on non payment of debt dues and see in this situation the peasant used to take loans from money lenders and at last they were not able to pay it back and when they were not able to pay it back the money lenders and the traders used to take away their land and at last at the end of the day the complete loss was upon the peasants and the farmers they 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 were losing their lands also okay and then the other issue is that british policy discouraged indian handicrafts and promoted british goods that was really a very big mistake as the highly skilled indian craftsmen were forced to look for alternate sources of employment that hardly existed as the destruction of indian handicrafts was not accompanied by the development of modern industries so it was really difficult for the handicraftsmen also and in 1853 karl marx remarked something that it was the british intruder who broke up the indian handloom and destroyed the spinning wheel england began with depriving the indian cottons from the european market it then introduced twist into the hindustan and in the end inundated the very mother country of cotton with cottons that was something really nice by karl marx and let's see some other issues with the zamindars Zamindars the traditional landed aristocracy often saw their land rights fortified with frequent use of a co warrant by the administration when the zamindars <coughs> saw that their land rights were fortified with the britishers that resulted in a loss of status for them in the villages among the other normal poor peasants and the farmers and that was really that really affected their zamindars as in avadh the storm center of the revolt 21 talukdars had their estates confiscated and suddenly found themselves without a source of income and at the end of the day they were unable to work ashamed to beg and condemned to penury and the ruination of indian industry increased the pressure on agriculture and land the lopsided development in which resulted in pauperization of the country in general and that's it the economic causes and we'll move on to the political causes so the political causes are the east india company's greedy policy of aggrandizement accompanied by broken pledges and oaths resulted in loss of political prestige for it because these britishers introduced some uh, ma- many things that were against the uh, religious cultures of the indians both for the hindus and the muslims such as they brought up effective control subsidiary alliance and doctor of flaps and let's see what is effective control effective control or indirect rule is a broad term which encompasses all the policies the british used to gain de facto control over the indian princely states okay that's what is effective control and let's see what subsidiary alliance subsidiary alliance 
the concept of subsidiary alliance is something in which the British used their military might to strike up a military alliance with the princely states in return of compensation. And there are some terms dictated by the British on behalf of the subsidiary alliance. And those are an Indian ruler entering into a subsidiary alliance with the British had to accept British forces within his territory and also agreed to pay for their maintenance. The ruler would accept a British resident officer in his state. An Indian ruler who entered into a subsidiary alliance would not enter into any further alliance with any other power. The ruler would not employ any Europeans other than the British and if he were already doing so, he would dismiss them. In case of a conflict with any other state, he would agree the resolution decided upon by the British. In return for the ruler accepting its conditions, the company undertook to protect the state from external dangers and also internal disorders. In the Indian rulers failed to make sorry, if the Indian rulers failed to make the payments required by the alliance, then part of their territory was to be taken away as a penalty, and that was a bad thing for the rulers or the princely states. And according to this alliance, only half of our no, you should note this only half of Avadh was annexed by the British due to non payment of the state. Such an agreement, as uh, sorry, such an arrangement was offered to many states in India and caused much loss to the princely states. That's subsidiary alliance. Let's see what's doctrine of lapse. You all know what's doctrine of lapse. Still, then, the doctrine of lapse was an annexation policy applied by the Lord Dalhousie in India before 1858. According to the doctrine, any Indian princely state under the Zuaranti of the British East India Company as a vassal state under the British subsidiary system would have its princely status abolished if the ruler was neither if the ruler was either manifestly incompetent or died without a male heir. By this doctrine of lapse, they mean that if in a princely state if a if a if a ruler dies and he doesn't have a male heir the state will automatically go under the britishers that's it okay so that's a doctor of lapse and the right of succession was denied to hindu princes yeah that's something different and these are the political causes for the revolt of 1857 and let's move on to the administrative causes rampant corruption in the company's administration especially among the police petty officials and lower low courts and the absentee sovereignty ship character of british rule imparted a foreign and alien look to it in the eyes of Indians. Obviously these are normal corruptions that happen in the administrative sections now also and these are the administrative causes so we'll move on to the socio-religious causes and this is something really important because this has to do a lot of things uh, with Indians obviously. So what are, what, what are the social religious causes? Racial overtones and a superiority complex characterize the British administrative attitude towards the native Indian population. Obviously, the attempts at socio religious reform, such as abolition of sati, support to widow remarriage, and women's education, were seen by a large section of the population as interference in the social and religious domains of Indian society by outsiders. The, these are the main three things that affected the Indians in the social religious causes such as abolition of sati, support to widow remarriage and women's education. These are the things that Indians really can't even think in those periods. And some other things also are there. Religious Disabilities Act of 1856. What uh, Religious Disabilities Act of 1856 is something that states that and this act actually modified the Hindu Hindu customs because before this act came into effect 
in india it was like if a person changed his religion if he get converted to another religion he won't be inheriting the property of his heathen father that was prohibited but soon after this act came the religious disabilities act in 1856 and that modified the hindu customs for instance declaring that a change of religion did not debar a son from inheriting the property of his heathen father and that was really something good if we look that is really good so that's it the social religious causes and uh, we uh, let's move to the influence of outside events there are many events in uh, which happened outside also uh, the revolt of 1857 coincided with certain outside events in which the british suffered serious losses such as they uh, suffered a serious losses in first afghan war which was during 1838 to 1842 then in punjab wars 1845 to 1849 then in crimean wars 1854 to 1856 and last but not the least santal rebellion in 1855 to 1857 and that's it for influence of outside events and let's move to discontent among sepoys so let's see what's the discontent among sepoys so major major issues were restrictions on wearing caste and sectarian marks and secret rumors of proselytizing activities of chaplains were interpreted by indian sepoys who were generally conservative by nature as interference in their religious affairs and the other issues are in 1856 lord canning's government passed the general en- service enlistment act which decreed that all future recruits to bengal army would have to give an undertaking to serve anywhere their services might be required by the government and this really caused resentment the indian sepoy was equally unhappy with this emolument compared to his british counterpart as a more immediate cause of the sepoy's dissatisfaction was the order that they would not be given the foreign service allowance when serving in sindh or in punjab and that was a serious issue and the sepoy is in fact was a peasant in uniform whose consciousness what was not divorced from that of the rural population okay and finally there had been a long history of revolts in british india army in bengal in 1764 velour in 1806 barakpur in 1825 and during the afghan wars in during 1838 to 1842 and this were the discontent among the sepoys and let's see the beginning and the spread how did this begin and how did it spread actually the thing is that it began with a small spark like the reports about the mixing of bone dust in atta or floor and the introduction of the enfield rifle enhanced the sepoys growing disaffection with the government because the cartridge uh, uh, and this was one reason and the other reason is that the cartridge of the new rifle had to be bitten off before loading and the grease was reportedly made of beef and pig fat and that was really a serious issue because uh, among hindus and uh, among muslims they have some uh, religious issues with beef and pig so this affected them a lot because majority of the sepoys or majority of the uh, soldiers in the british uh, indian british, british indian army were from hindus and muslims and the army administration did nothing to allay these fears and the sepoys felt their religion was in grave danger okay so this was the major reason the enfield rifle was the major reason it sparked off everything which led into the revolt of 1857 so let's see how this began the revolt began at meerut okay the revolt began at meerut which is 58 kilometers from delhi and it spread rapidly uh, to punjab in the north and the narmada in the south to bihar in the east and rajputana in the west this was the boundary of the revolt and let's see how it started 
it was the 19th native infantry at Bahrampur which refused to use the newly introduced Enfield rifle and broke out in mutiny in February 1857 was disbanded in March 1857 a young sepoy of the 34th native infantry Mangal Pandey you guys know who is Mangal Pandey and if you don't know you can see the movie Mangal Pandey in which Amir Khan act uh, played the role of Mangal Pandey Okay, so it was Mangal Pandey who went a step further and fired at the sergeant major of his unit at Barakpur. And obviously, as usual, he was overpowered and executed on April 6th while his regiment was disbanded in May. The 7th Avad Regiment, which defied its officers on May 3rd, met with a similar fate. And then comes the 1990 men of 3rd Native Cavalry refused to accept the greased cartridges, the same uh, rifle, uh, Enfield rifle. On May 9th, 85 of them among the 90 men, uh, 85 of them were dismissed and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment and put in fetters. And this was which sparked off a general mutiny among the Indian soldiers stationed at Meerut. The very next day, that is on May 10th, because that dismissal and sentenced uh, to 10 years in prison, that uh, punishment was given on May 9th and on the very next day on May 10th, they released their imprisoned comrades, that is the soldiers, uh, the sepoys, killed their officers and unfurled the banner of revolt and this was this is this was how they lightened the revolt this was how it all started they set off for delhi after sunset and in delhi they killed their own european officers including simon fraser the political agent and seized the city and lieutenant willoughby the officer in charge of the magazine at delhi offered some resistance but was overcome. He was also defeated by, by the sepoys. And at, in, in Delhi, they found Bahadur Shah Safar, the last Mughal. He was very old and powerless, but they proclaimed him as the Emperor of India. And now this spontaneous rising of the last Mughal king to the leadership of the country was a recognition of the fact that the long reign of Mughal dynasty had become the traditional symbol of India's political unity. <clears throat> and the entire Bengal army soon rose in revolt with spread which spread equally which sorry which spread quickly. Avad, Rohilkhand, the Daub, the Bundelkhand, Central India, large part parts of Bihar and East Punjab shook off British authority. And uh, then the about the peasant zamindas, the peasants and the petty zamindas gave free expressions to their grievances by attacking the money lenders and zamindas who had displaced them from the land. They took advantage of the revolt to destroy the money lenders' account books and debt records. And see, th this is something really a big issue because most of them were not aware of the revolt. I mean, they were aware of the revolt, but they were not aware of the reason why the revolt was happening. Many of the peasants and the petty uh, peasants and the poor farmers were involved in the revolt only for their personal needs, and we'll discuss about it later. And uh, one important fact is that one lakh fifty thousand men who died fighting the English in Awad, among them over one lakh were civilians. And that is a really an important fact because we can we can notice that it was about one lakh fifty thousand men. And among them, one lakh were civilians. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the storm centers and leaders of the revolt. This portion is quite interesting because we will be going through many characters who were involved in the revolt. So it's storm centers and leaders of the revolt. So, Delhi, the nominal and symbolic leadership belonged to the Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah. But the real command lay with a court of soldiers headed by General Bhakt Khan. See, Delhi was the focal point of the revolt and it was headed by the Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah. That's okay. But as he was weak and very old age, the real command was under 
a group of soldiers headed by general bhakt khan okay and then the revolt of bareilly troops but okay so uh, sorry the soldiers headed by general bhakt khan who had led the revolt of bareilly troops and brought them to delhi okay the court consisted of 10 members six from the army and four from the civilian departments that that is quite interesting because they had a uh, majority from the army and uh, four from the civilian departments that's quite interesting and then em as emperor bahadur shah was perhaps the weakest link in the chain of leadership of the revolt his weak personality old age and lack of leadership qualities created political weakness at the nerve center of the revolt okay and let's go to kanpur what was happening in kanpur at kanpur the natural choice was nana saheb and nana saheb was the adopted son of the last peshwa bajirao 2 okay and he was refused the family title and banished from pune was living near kanpur and he declared himself as the governor of the emperor bahadur shah and sir huge wheeler commanding sta- commanding the station surrendered on june 27 1857 okay and bajirao to you all know it's bajirao mastani uh, ranveer singh acted played the role of bajirao okay and then let's move on to begum hazrat mahal took over took over the re- reins of lucknow where the rebellion broke out on june 4 1857 and popular sympathy was overwhelming in favor of the deposed nawab her son burjis khader was proclaimed the nawab and uh, it was henry lawrence the british resident the european inhabitants and few hundred loyal sepoys took shelter in the residency and the residency was besieged by the indian rebels and sir henry was killed during the siege okay so and along with henry lawrence there were also some other britishers such as sir henry havelock and sir james outram who were not very successful in re- recovering such places uh, such as lucknow and kanpur uh, but finally it was sir colin campbell the new commander in chief evacuated the europeans with the help of gorkha regiments in march 1858 the city was finally recovered by the british but guerrilla activities continued till september of the same year that is 1858 Let's move on to Bareilly. At Bareilly, it was Khan Bahadur Khan, a descendant of the former ruler of Rohil Khand, was placed in command. And uh, here, the most interesting thing is that in the revolt of 1857, each one had their own personal needs or their own reasons to be a part of the revolt. And the reason for Khan Bahadur Khan was that he was not enthusiastic about the pension being granted by the British, and he organized the revolt of 1857. an army of 40000 soldiers and offered stiff resistance to the britishers by khan bahadur khan he he had an army of 40000 soldiers okay and then go to bihar we'll go to bihar and in bihar it was kuwar singh the zamindar of jagdishpur an old man in his 70s he nursed a grudge against the british who had deprived him of his estates he unhesitatingly joined the sepoys when they reached ara from dinapur then its maulvi ahmadullah of faizabad was another outstanding leader of the revolt he was a native of madras in south india and he just moved on to faizabad in north india nothing much about him then and, and now comes the most interesting part of the revolt the most outstanding leader of the revolt was rani lakshmi bai who assumed the leadership of the sepoys at jhansi and it was lord dalhousi the governor general who refused to allow her adopted son to succeed to the throne after her husband's death that is raja gambadhar rao when he died lord dalhousi refused to allow so sorry he refused to allow her adopted son to succeed to the throne because he just put on the doctor of labs 
So he annexed the state by the application of Doctrine of Lapse. And she gave the battle cry, Main apni jhansi nahi dungi, which means I shall not give away my jhansi. And she joined, she was joined by Tantia Toop, a close associate of Nana Sahib in Kanpur. After the loss of Kanpur, Tantia Toop just came down and he just came down to help uh, Jansi Rani. And Rani Jansi and Tantia Toop marched towards Gwalior. Okay, that, that was the scenario. And it was the doctor of labs that caused the issue in Jansi. Uh, not only the Doctor of Labs and Doctor of Labs and Lada Dalla House, okay? Seriously. <laughs> suppression of revolt. So let's move on to the suppression of revolt. How was the revolt suppressed by the Britishers? The revolt was finally suppressed. The British captured Delhi on September 28th, 1857 after prolonged and bitter fighting. John Nicholson, the leader of the seas, and he was badly wounded. Obviously, he should be. Bahadur Shah was taken to prison. The royal princes were captured and butchered on the spot, publicly shot at Plank Point. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Publicly shot at Point Blank Range by Lieutenant Hudson, Hudson himself. The emperor was exiled to Rangoon, where he died in 1862. Okay, so that's that 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 there started the end of the revolt okay and with the fall of the delhi the focal point of the revolt disappeared one by one all the great leaders of the revolt fell and everything the the fire was com going to coming to an end everything was coming to an end okay and uh, let's see what happened in each places Sir Colin Campbell occupied Kanpur on December 6th, 1857 and Nana Sahib was defeated at Kanpur and he escaped to Nepal in early 1859 and he never came back. It is believed that it's uh, he just got into the hands of the tribes in Nepal. I don't know, it's just a story. <coughs> then his close associate Tantia Tope who escaped and went into the jungles of central India, was captured while he was sleeping in April 1859 and put to death. Then the Rani of Jansi had died on the battlefield earlier in June 1858. Jansi was recaptured through assault by Sir Hugh Rose Hugh by 18, uh, and by 1859 coercing Bhakti Khan, Khan Bahadur Khan of Bareilly and Rao Sahib, who was brother of Nana Sahib, and Maulvi Ahmadullah were all dead while the Begum of Awadh was compelled to hide in Nepal. <coughs> and by the end of 1859, British authority over India was fully re-established. And that was the almost end. No, that was not almost. That was the end of the revolt of 1857 or the Sipoy mutiny. And if you guys want to read what I have highlighted, just post the video and you can read it. And just read the highlighted portions only. Okay, no need of reading the entire notes. Just read the highlighted portions. That is enough. Um, I assure you that. That is enough. Okay, and now let's move on to the causes of failure of revolt. There are many causes of failure of revolt. Okay, because it was a mutiny. So there was many causes. So let's discuss about the first cause. The first cause is all India participation was absent. Seriously, the All India participation was really absent. The eastern, southern and western parts of India remained more or less unaffected. They were not at all involved in that. Okay, that's the first reason. And the second cause is that all classes did not join. Certain classes and groups did not join and, in fact, worked against the revolt. Like, big zamindas acted as break, breakwaters to storm. Even Avad Tarsildas backed off one's promises of land restitution were spelt out. And moneylenders and merchants suffered the wrath of the mutineers badly and anyway saw their class interests better protected under British patronage. And that was really bad. And then comes modern educated Indians viewed this revolt as backward looking and mistakenly hoped the British would usher in an era of modernization. Most Indian rulers refused to join and often gave active help to the Britishers. That was the main reason of the failure of the revolt. Most of the Indian rulers were 
with the Britishers. Let's see who all were there. Uh, Sindhya of Gwalior, Holkar of Indore, and the rulers of Patiala, S rulers of Sindh, the Sikh chieftains, and last but not the least, in the north, Maharaja of Kashmir. These were the Indian rulers who were with the Britishers, I mean, who were against the revolt of 1857. And then comes the other cause is that poor arms and equipments. Obviously, the Indian soldiers were poorly equipped as they were fighting with swords, spears and very few guns and muskets. On the other hand, the European soldiers were equipped with the latest weapons of war like Enfield rifle. And also, the electric telegraph kept the commander-in-chief informed about the movements and strategy of the rebels. And that was really awesome. And that was the poor, and, poor arms and equipments. And the other cause is that uncoordinated and poorly organized. Yeah, that is the very big cause of the revolt. It was really unorganized and it was poorly organized. It was really un uncoordinated and poorly organized. No coordination or central leadership was there. Okay, the principal rebel leaders Nana Sahib, Tantya Tob, Kuar Singh, Lakshmi Bai were no match to their British opponents in generalship. On the other hand, the East India Company was fortunate in having the services of men of exceptional abilities in the Lawrence Brothers, John Nicholson, James Outram, Henry Havelock, Edward, etc. etc. Many of them are there who were very good at their leadership, but we lacked leadership. The mutineers lacked a clear understanding of colonial rules. Okay, so this is another reason we doesn't we, we didn't have a unified ideology. The mutineers lacked a clear understanding of colonial rule. The mutineers, some were having another thought, some were having another thought. They were not having the same thought about the revolt. Okay. First of all, the thing is that they were not aware about the colonial rule. And the other thing is that the rebels represented diverse elements with differing grievances and concepts of current politics. We noticed earlier that the peasants and the poor farmers were fighting against the money lenders and zamindars who were Indians because for them this was personal. They were taking the advantage of the revolt. They, they because they were thinking that they are, they were just thinking that they were suffering only because of the petty uh, the zamindars and uh, you know money lenders because they lost their money they lost their land so they were just taking this this situation very personal and they were fighting against those money lenders not against they were not involved in the revolt completely and that's a very big reason that we were not having a common ideology okay in fact the revolt of 1857 played an important role in bringing the indian people together yes that's really right that the revolt of 1857 played an important role in bringing the indian people together and imparting to them the consciousness of belonging to one country yes that's true because before 1857 people living in this country were not having an idea of india india they, they were not having an idea of india or indians but it was soon after this revolt of 1857 that they were conscious about their own country. They were conscious about, they started being conscious about one country that is India and being the citizens of this country that is Indians. And that was so, we should thank for the revolt of 1857 that at least it has made something good. And uh, the other thing is that Hindu-Muslim unity. That we should talk about that because during the entire revolt there was complete cooperation between hindus and muslims at all levels people soldiers leaders that's really true both hindus and muslims were all represented in leadership for instance nana saheb had azimullah a muslim and an expert in political propaganda as an aide while lakshmi bai had the solid support of afghan soldiers yeah so it is clear cut that during this revolt hindu muslim unity was at its peak and that's really good okay and let's move on to the nature of the revolt 
it was a mere sepoy mutiny to some british historians like a, a wholly unpatriotic and selfish sepoy mutiny with no native leadership and no popular support said sir john sealy see many peoples each one have their own different opinion so uh, this portion is not that important nature of the revolt you can read if you want you can post the video and you can read i'm not sliding so fast okay and uh, yeah this is something quite interesting according to marxist historians the 1857 revolt was the struggle of the soldier peasant democratic combine against foreign as well as feudal bondage ah, however this view does not stand scrutiny in the light of the fact that the leaders of the revolt themselves came from a feudal background yes and at last it had seeds of nationalism and anti-imperialism but the concept of common nationality and nationhood was not inherent to the revolt of 1857 okay one may say that the revolt of 1857 was the first great struggle of indians to throw off british rule yeah yeah it might be but see before 1857 also there have been many revolts in india we should know that and uh, it established local traditions of resistance to british rule which were the pave which were to pave the way for the modern national movement okay so that's it and let's move to the conse consequences which is which is going to be the last part of this chapter consequences i think you should read there are five points you should read it and i also read it The revolt of 1857 marks a turning point in the history of India. It led to changes in the system of administration and the policy of the government. Yeah, uh, because the first thing is that you notice that you should read this. The direct responsibility for the administration of the country was assumed by the British Crown, and company rule was abolished. The assumption of the government of India by the sovereign of Great Britain was announced by Lord Canning at a darbar at Allahabad. in the queen's proclamation issued on november 1st 1858 and then comes the era of annexations and expansion ended and the british promised to respect the dignity and rights of the native princes then the indian states were henceforth to recognize the paramountcy of the british crown and were to be treated as parts of a single church and third point is that the army which was at the forefront of the outbreak was thoroughly re reorganized and british military policy came to be dominated by the idea of division and counterpoise and the last point is that racial hatred and suspicion between the indians and the english was aggravated that these all these all were the consequences of revolt of 1857 and some of them are really good consequences and some are bad obviously so that's the end of this chapter and we are winding it for today we will meet in the next class or in the next video with something uh, some other interesting things and see you can notice that views of many people are written here you can post the video and read it i'll slide slowly okay and uh, yeah in the, there is also a summary portion where you can summarize everything that i told earlier that everything is here economic causes political causes military causes center of revolts everything blah 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 nature effect everything is there and that's the end of this chapter thank you for listening to me thank you thanks a lot have a nice day study well all the best